So we're continuing uh, the series of messages that I have uh, prepared in the book of First Thessalonians. And um, this morning uh, we're going to be moving into First Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18. And um, the title for my message this morning is Glorious Hope for the Future. So, well, before we start, it doesn't feel right not to pray over the word. So let's bow. Jesus, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you've given it to us so that we can grow healthy in you. And God, that your truth would come forward uh, in a way that people could grasp and understand. And for those that are here that know you, God, what a wonderful promise we have in the word today. For those of you, for those that don't know you at this point, Lord, we just pray that you would you would show them how much they are loved by you this morning and how great of a future awaits those who come to know you. We just pray your blessing upon this word in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the first, the first weeks that Paul was with the Thessalonian church, uh, he had taught them about the soon return of Jesus. And uh, the believers there accepted this message that Paul brought them, and, and, um, and they believed that it would happen probably within their lifetime. And because of the great persecution that had been going on in the Thessalonian church for holding fast to the gospel message, um, this thought that Jesus was coming soon to take them home had given them great hope. The hope that they had produced endurance. And the believers were not distracted by the hard times that they had to face, as they grew in their faith in God and they grew in their love for one another. Yet after the Apostle Paul left, he was only with them for a few short weeks upon the establishment of the church. Paul and Silas, um, due to persecution, had to leave early. Um, the believers were wondering about certain things concerning the second coming of Jesus. And... Um, as they wondered, they thought about those of, uh, among their number who had passed away. And um, they were troubled by this thought uh, that the deceased Christians um, might somehow miss the victory and blessing of the second coming of the Lord and the rapture of his church. So Paul addressed this issue um, with them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 13 to 18, and, and we're going to start with verse 13. So Paul says to these individuals that are listening to his letter, brothers and sisters, we don't want or we do not want you to be uninformed about those who sleep in death, so that you do not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. You see, to an unbelieving world, the prospect of death is a scary thought. For there is much uncertainty as to what's going to take place in the afterlife once you breathe your last in this body. Some hold to the thought that there is no afterlife. And that once you die, everything ends for you as you permanently go six feet under the ground and they bury you, that's the end. And this is the preferred view of the atheist who sees creation as a product of evolution and everything that exists as a product of chance. And as we are all aware, this worldview has become the predominant teaching in our public school systems and post-secondary education institutions. And it's the same thought we see that has arisen and has been taught in Marxist society since the early part of the 20th century. Belief in God or in anything spiritual is simply labeled as primitive thinking that has no foundation on what is called science. And sadly, friends, as we look across this nation of ours and our culture, we're reaping the fruit of this worldview in the society that we live in today. It's lost its bearings. It's lost its bearings with 
what is true, bearings on every issue concerning morality. Every issue becomes now relative choice rather than fixed principle. And this kind of belief system that we have been, I guess you steeped in, only reinforces the thought that since you are going to cease to exist after death, you might as well get the most out of life that you can. Life becomes all about living for the moment. And when you embrace this thought, you become a god of your own destiny, building a legacy for your own empire, becoming the chief of your own realm. And the goal of the individual is to build something here in the physical realm, something that's substantial. And from that life view perspective, the one who has the most toys in the end before they're buried into the ground wins. But addressing the thought that uh, I've discussed with you today, Jesus once told a parable. And he talked to the people about the futility of living for the moment in ignorance of all that is happening in the spiritual around, around them, around you. In Luke chapter 12, 15 to 21, Jesus said, then he said to them, watch out, be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of of possessions. And then he told them this parable, a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And then he said, ah, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store up my surplus grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this night, your, this very night, your life will be demanded from you. And then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich towards God, toward God. My friends, although we find ourselves caught in a society where the foolishness of secular humanism is the prevailing ideology. I am so thankful that we have come to see life through a different set of lenses. Amen? See, the world that we live in testifies that God is real. And even those who staunchly hold to their opinions that God does not exist must, at some point, when they look at at the vastness of creation, think that maybe they might just be mistaken. As the psalmist says in Psalm 19, verses 1 to 4, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They Use no words, no sound is heard from them, yet their voice goes out into all of the earth, their words to the end of the world. The psalmist knew that there is a greater purpose than what is seen. Contrary to what is taught by the atheist educators of our school system, everything did not come from emptiness in the cosmos. When you look at the stars, they reveal knowledge. They reveal knowledge. Life has a greater purpose than just living and dying and trying to make it through the day. There is more, a more fulfilling way to live than just seeking pleasure to satisfy fleshly cravings. There is a God in heaven, our creator, who saves, delivers, and brings healing to people. 
And he is the centerpiece for everything that is and was and is to come. The Bible tells us that Jesus Christ, the eternal living word of God, who is God in the flesh, created the world and all life within it. As it is written in Hebrews chapter 1-3, the sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of majesty in heaven. He was a light that came from heaven, like a beacon in this darkened world. Many did not recognize Jesus for who he was. Many today still do not recognize him for who he is. But all who receive him. To those who believe on his name, he gave the right to become children of God, children not born of blood, nor the desire or the will of man, but children that are born of God. And for those of us who have come to know him, we know that Jesus is not just a story made up from someone's creative imagination. He is God in the flesh, creator of the universe, savior of the world. Jesus is alive, and he did not create us to be like a snow globe. You know what I mean, eh? He didn't just create us to be a snow globe that he just shakes around and watches. No, he, he created us to interact with us. There's more to this life than just living and dying and trying to make it through the day. The creator of the universe has called out and said, whoever will come, come unto me. And if you're broken and you're weary and you need hope this morning, come unto me, says the Lord God, come unto me. All you who are weary and burdened and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord has rest that this world knows nothing about. And when you start down the pathway without God, you have no hope inside of you. No real hope. But when you come to know the King of Kings and your Creator, He interacts with you and He gives you hope. For the atheists who doubt God's exists, existence, mark my words, there will be a day of discovery. There will be a day of discovery. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is the Lord. The Lord calls you today to let go of your pride and put your trust in him. You can come to know the living God through Jesus today. He's as close as the mention of his name. You can come to know the lordship of Christ before your death in this present state. For it is written in Hebrews chapter 9, 27 and 28, just as people are destined to die once and after that to face judgment, so Christ sacrificed once to take away the sins of many. And he will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for him. You don't have to discover the reality of Jesus on judgment day. God has made provisions for you to come to know him right now. All he asks is that you admit that you need him and that you surrender your will and life in service to him. That you're willing to set aside everything that isn't important in this world which is just going to go away and embrace that which is eternal. That which is real. And those of us who have done this We've encountered the living God. I'm so thankful. I don't know about you. Aren't you thankful for a relationship with the living God? That the Holy Spirit is alive in us. 
The people out there don't understand because they're, they're cloaked in darkness and they don't see the power of God. But when the blinders are taken off, the Holy Spirit comes into us and lives in us and God relates to us as a father to a child and not a broken father like so many of us have experienced in this world. He is a good, good father, a perfect father, a father who is just and loving a Father who takes care of us and every need that we have. We've encountered this if we've come to Christ and we become alive in the Spirit. We've been born again. And there's a word of encouragement this morning from Paul in Ephesians 2, 1 to 5. He says this, he says, As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live, when you followed the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work and those who are disobedient, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we are by nature deserving of wrath, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive in Christ Jesus, even when we are dead in our transgressions. It is by grace that you've been saved. Amen. But the Thessalonians were troubled because there was those among them that had passed away since the Apostle Paul had visited. What about these people? They asked. They were asking inside. And Paul knew this. He had told them that Jesus was coming back to set up his kingdom in the earth and that they would enter this kingdom to reign with the Lord. But what about those ones that had passed away ahead of Jesus coming? What was going to happen to them? So the apostle sets the record straight by bringing them a new revelation. The scripture is full of the revelation of God. And this was a new one to them. Paul told them that he did not want them to be uninformed about those who sleep in death so they would not grieve like the rest of mankind who have no hope. Essentially, Paul is telling them that he has some information for them about their departed loved ones. Information that will bring them hope. Reading from verses 14 and 15 of our text, we're told, for we believe that Jesus died and rose again. And so we believe that God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. According to the Lord's word, we tell you that we who are still alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will certainly not precede those who have fallen asleep. When Paul says sleep and death, Paul's not referring to soul sleep as though brothers and sisters who passed away would not be immediately ushered into the presence of Jesus. What he means by sleep is simply that the people have died. And the New Testament consistently shows us that souls do not sleep in that there is no um, connection point with the Lord during that time. For instance, the thief on the cross. He looked at the Lord while they were being crucified and he recognized Jesus for who he was. And although he had lived a life of crime, he recognized Christ beside him. Unlike his partner who was also being crucified, who cursed and mocked the Lord, this man said, Jesus, will you remember me when you enter your kingdom, Lord? And what did Jesus say? He said that that very day, that he would be with him in paradise. Further than this, Paul teaches that God's children who are absent in body are present with Jesus. Philippians 1, 23b to 24, Paul stated this, I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. But aside from this, Paul tells the Thessalonians that there is hope for eternal life in Jesus when the believers pass from this world of sin. And this hope then leads us to grieve differently 
for our loved ones in Christ who have passed away. Paul does not rebuke them for being sorrowful when they lose a beloved one. No. Jesus himself wept when he heard Lazarus had died, his friend, knowing full well that he would immediately be raising him from the dead. But Paul states that the grief that believers experience has a different tone, this is what he's saying, has a different tone than the grief that comes without hope. If you've ever seen someone lose a loved one outside of the community of of Jesus, it's a terrible sight to behold. It really is. In my life, I've seen this, and it's not very nice. But for the believer, there is a different tone. Heaven changes everything. It changes everything. The believer has a glorious future to look forward to. It's not just about this life. Now, we're talking about everlasting life. And not just everlasting life, but an everlasting life that is glorious, far beyond what we experience here and now. You think you're alive here and now? You are not alive here and now compared to what you're going to be. (laughs) The eye has not seen, nor has the ear heard, nor has it even entered into the mind of men the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Amen. Amen. So the Thessalonians were thinking that possibly those who died before Christ's coming might miss out on seeing the glory of his coming kingdom. But Paul reassures them that this isn't the case. And just before the crucifixion of Christ, I'm going to tell you about this a little bit. We're going to talk about it. Jesus was in a town called Bethany, just outside of Jerusalem. Just before the crucifixion. The setting is that his friend Lazarus grew sick and subsequently died of the illness that he had. Jesus could have intervened, but he purposely waited four days after Lazarus' death so that he could demonstrate something. Jesus wanted the people to see that he had authority over life and death. In John 11, Jesus enters Bethany, enters Bethany and converses with Lazarus' sister, Martha. And from verse 23 to 27 of that story, we read that Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied. I believe that you're the Messiah, the Son of God, who's come into the world. So Jesus, after, after speaking this to Martha, he proceeds to approach the tomb of Lazarus where he asked that the stone which blocked the entrance to Lazarus' cave tomb was to be rolled away. Lazarus, he calls out, come forth! And the dead man who had been dead for four days breathe life. And he came out and stood with Jesus. And that miracle, my friends, was right before the time when Jesus went to the cross. It was another sign to the people that the Lord Jesus Christ has life and death in his hands. He is the creator. The living word of God is the creator. And there is nothing that can separate us from his love. Jesus proceeded from the tomb of Lazarus to go and give his life as a sacrifice on the cross at Calvary so that those who are lost in sin could have redemption and be brought back into a proper relationship with God, a living relationship, a vibrant relationship, one that starts here and now in this world, in this world that we live, this flesh and blood world, and resonates into eternity At the time Jesus comes back again, he will come back with the people whose spirits have been residing with him in paradise. Paul explains his thoughts in a prophetic word 
through verse 16 of our text. He says this, For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a loud command, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet call of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. (laughs) Wow. Doesn't that blow your mind? Like if this is the first time you've ever heard that, this is a mind-blowing concept here, right? Ponder this verse for a second. Jesus brought life and immortality, life and immortality to light by the gospel. And the basis of the Christian life and the believer's hope is the resurrection of Christ. As surely as we believe that Christ died and rose again, so we believe that those who have died in him will be raised and will participate in the glory of his coming. And at just the right time, Jesus will come down from heaven with the saints who died in him. And upon entry into the scene, (laughs) Jesus will be heralded by the voice of an archangel and the sound of a loud trumpet call. And then the spirits of those who died in Christ will rise bodily from the grave. The earth and the sea will yield up all the dust of the dead in Christ, which will be formed into new, powerful, eternal, glorified bodies. What was steeped in weakness will be resurrected in power and in glory. And the risen saints will rise to be with Jesus in his glorified body in which he is in right now. And all these saints will be free forever from the sickness, death, and pain of this realm. And the apostle gives more detail about this event even than he does in Thessalonians and 1 Corinthians 15. And in 51 to 54, he says, listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will all, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable. And the mortal with immortality. And then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? For those who are in the Lord, there is no longer a sting. The old things will be passed away and everything will be made new. But people, this isn't the end of this glorious event. In verses 17 and 18 of our text this morning, we read, After that, we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will be with the Lord forever. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. Not all believers are going to die. But those who are alive when Jesus comes in glory, with all the saints that have died, will all be changed. My friend, on that great and glorious day that is in the not too distant future, I believe, There will be a generation of Christians living on the earth, and it may be ours, that will not be leaving through a casket. Amen? (laughs) We will not, if this is the generation, be leaving in a casket. We will not taste the sting of death. In a moment in time, we will hear the angelic heralding of the coming of Jesus and the voice of the archangel announcing him. And then we will be with him forever. We'll rise. And in the twinkling of an eye, we'll meet him in the clouds. Friend, this is a glorious day for whoever gets to participate in that. Maybe us, maybe not. We don't know the day or the hour that the Son of Man comes. We do know the signs of the times are written all over the pages of Scripture and we see prophetically things unfolding all over the place. So we know that it is a time that is close. But friends, the good news is this. Whether we meet Him in paradise by our physical death here, 
or whether we are raptured from our feet and we never taste the sting of death, we are a blessed, blessed, blessed people. On that glorious day, there is going to be a mighty sound to hear, a mighty sight to see, an almighty meeting to enjoy. Those of us who believe will all experience the glory of this event. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive, and there is an inheritance of eternal life through Jesus' salvation for us. Jesus is alive, and he has a plan that will be unfurled at just the right time in history. Don't you find that encouraging? What can separate us from the love of God? Absolutely nothing can separate us from the love of God. To our folks who are listening online, maybe there's people here today too who are listening to this message and you've never received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. And it's not just a matter of coming to church or wearing a crucifix around your neck. God called you to surrender your life to him and be willing to follow him, to turn away from the paths that lead to destruction and come into newness of life in the spirit. This door, this door will not be open for long, but the door is open today. Today is the day of salvation. There is still time to respond, but this could change at any time. The Lord Jesus is coming soon. And the Apostle Peter said this, that the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Amen. Would you bow with me in prayer and ask the worship team to come forward. Jesus, we come to you. And we, first of all, want to thank you, Lord, for what you are and what you have done. You are God, and we are not, but you are the lover of our souls, our creator, who gave us life so that we could walk with you and be your children. What a privilege and honor it is, Lord. And Father, for those that are here today that know you, we bless your holy name. And we look forward to the day when we will see you face to face, when we will leave this world of sin. And we will be united with you, Lord, and all of the saints in eternal life. Father, there's maybe some that are listening to this message today that have never surrendered to you. If that's you today, you can surrender to Jesus. You don't have to live another minute outside of closeness with him. Are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you heavy laden? The Lord has rest for your soul. He's got a life for you that is eternal. And it starts here and now. If you're here today and you've never opened your spirit up to Jesus, I pray that today would be the day. You don't have to pray fancy prayer. You don't have to. Do a tradition. All you have to do is bow the knee of your heart to his majesty and ask him to forgive you and be willing to follow him and turn away from everything that is against him. And he will come into you. 
and will cleanse you, will cast your sins as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered again, cast into the sea of forgetfulness. And then, when your vessel inside has been cleaned by the work of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for you, the Holy Spirit will come and make his home in you so that you will never be alone. You can do this today. We're going to close in the song, and if you need prayer for whatever reason, we'll be standing up at the front here, and just don't be afraid to take a stand and do the right thing. In Jesus' name, may God's grace and peace rest on each one of you. And may you have a wonderful day and a week, should he tarry.